Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, my guest is Dan Fister. Dan is the CEO and founder of Winback Labs. Today, we are going to be talking about something most of you are overlooking and ignoring, which is where all the real value is in your pipeline, and it isn't in the cold new business. Today, we're going to be talking about winbacks, but there's your customer's customer, there's alumni, there's the family tree, there's the channel, there's partners, distribution, there's overseas subsidiaries, there's any number of different ways that you can grow your pipeline. And one of the most important and most overlooked is winning back former customers who may have gone because you were outsold new management layer came in and they brought in their best buddies from previous experience, or you flunked it the last time, this still doesn't mean you can't go back. You can go back and you can go back and apologize. I mean, heaven forbid you could actually swallow your ego and find out what went wrong. The worst that could happen there is you might learn a lesson. So, Dan, without any further ado, Let's have a couple of minutes on your history. And how did you get to be one of the world's leading experts on winning back business? Like so many other people, I was solving my own problem. <laughs> I co-founded a business a number of years ago. <clears throat> it was a business subscription. We were an aggregator of business information and condenser. And we had grown and grown and grown and grown. And we uh, generated over 50,000 customers. And then in 2016, the wheels started to come off. We, uh, attrition started going through the roof and it got us really scared. Like, you know, we got hit bad in the dot com. We got hit bad in uh, 2008, but there wasn't any external reasons for us losing all these customers like there were in those times. So, so what I did was uh, I did a win back campaign. Now I had already sent out three emails. Whenever anybody left, we just sent out three emails and I figured if that didn't get them back or get the conversation started that they were gone. But our back was against the wall. And uh, so I just threw everything I could at (laughs) winning them back. And I wasn't very optimistic because, like I said, why would they come back? We already asked them to come back. They didn't. So we did the campaign, and it was nuts. In 20 years of marketing, I had never generated that much revenue in so little time at such a low cost. It was just like an epiphany. It's like these people really will come back, but you need to approach them properly. You need to do it intelligently. You need to do it strategically. And I got so enamored with how much there. did it cost you to acquire those customers? And what was the uh, difference between co- uh, acquiring them cold? Acquiring them cold was about, uh, well, it depends on the group, but let's just say it was $850. There's one big group that our, our cost of acquisition was about $850. And to win them back literally cost phone and email outreach. And so <laughs> maybe $100 worth of time for that group. So like, it was like an eighth, 12%. And, you know, the, the, like I said, the, the, the sales cycles are so much short, were so short, right? So it took very few resources, right? Because they already knew us. They are, we didn't have to educate them on the product. We didn't have to build relationships, didn't have to build trust. All that stuff was already done. And, the, and like I said, the, the cost was phone and email outreach. So we didn't have to go pay for ads or lists from Zoom info or spend months and months generating a partnership. You know, that stuff had already been done. Dan, before you go too deep, can you finish the rest of the model, please? Sure. So I was just enamored with Winback. Like in 20 years of marketing, like I said, I'd never seen anything like this. This was this was uh, like an epiphany for me. So what I did is I spent a ton of time optimizing the process and learning and learning and learning and testing. And then I wanted to learn more. So what I did is I did a win-back study. There wasn't much data out there, and this would give me a chance to keep talking to more and more revenue leaders and learning their strategies for win-back. So I got a lot of more strategies there. It was a real kind of a bummer, you know, when the the study was done, because I had nobody interesting to talk to about win-back anymore. (laughs) So what I did is I started a podcast, and I went out looking for people, uh, you know, really smart people who'd done win-back, hearing their stories. And so now I'm writing a book called Million Dollar Win Back. And what I'm doing in that book is I'm basically sharing all the lessons I've learned since 2016 about winning back lost customers. Very interesting. Okay, so when we think about it, 
why is it that we spend so much effort and time as a profession, I use the term loosely, on cold, direct new business, which has roughly a 3% to 5% win rate. And that's after marketing has sent across the leads where they had a 15% conversion rate on 3% who responded. So yeah. we're talking about an awful lot of noise for very, very, very little return and probably quite a lot of damage in the process. Why do we fixate on that end of the pipeline instead of the more efficient ways, such as Wimbax, such as ecosystems and partnering, referrals? I think it's uh, familiarity. Familiarity is a very powerful human drive. We have a, a fear of the unfamiliar. It's called neophobia. You know, our, our ancestors, they only ate foods that they were familiar with. They only associated with people they were familiar with. And it's, I think it's the same thing with business. When we built our companies, we started with acquisition. And that's very familiar. We really understood acquisition. Then we did retention. Then we did, I'm sorry, then we did expansion. Then we did retention. All these things are very familiar. And so I think that it's this is the way we've been successful. We're going to continue doing that. And we're closed off to everything else because why would we put our necks out on the line to do anything different? It could be as simple as that. I don't know. That's 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 my take on it. What are the blind spots people have with Winback? Because I'm sure there must be a certain amount of resistance until the penny drops. And even then, the idea of maybe going back and eating some humble pie might be a little bit challenging for a few. There's two ways of, of, of answering that. I can answer it with, I'm a revenue leader and somebody comes in and wants to do win back, okay? I'm going to tell them, I'm probably going to tell them, no, you're going to wait, you're wasting your time, do it this way. Well, there's a, a gentleman I interviewed on the podcast, Carl Adamson. And uh, when when uh, when he was just starting out, he he saw the, the the salespeople, they had all the nice cars, you know, they they were making the big money and he wanted a, he was a buyer and he wanted to dip his toe into the sales pool. So he, he pestered the sales manager and the sales manager just ended up saying, okay, he gave him six debt accounts, six mm -hmm. accounts that weren't ever coming back. Yeah. Anyway, Carl came back a little while later and that very first account, he had not only won back, but he won it back at six times the company average sale, annual contract value. So did they take the account from him at that point? So, yeah, so exactly. So what they did is after he did that, they hauled him, they hauled him into the CEO's office. He got severely reprimanded. They brought in the, his uh, sales manager who gave him this and he, he almost lost his job. And the whole, the reason that Carl told me this story is that this is the way we do things here. You know, oh. that's how strong it is. And, oh. And, you know, this is not an outlier. You know, there's a, there's another woman I talked to, and she became the branch manager of a small office in a regional group. And the first thing she did when she, when she took over the branch is she saw all these dormant accounts. And she knew that this was the low-hanging fruit in the business. So she went out and she got her, her, her small team to first focus on those people, those lost accounts. And at the end of the year, she won branch manager of the year. She had a small office. She beat out the New York office, the Chicago office. And the reason she won, she beat them out. Is what she told me is this extra $700,000 of win back revenue put her over the top. You'd think, oh my God, you know, she, she did this amazing thing. She found this, this new revenue stream. But what happened? Nothing. They would not, after she's named branch manager of the year and celebrated for her sales, she thought, great, I can get this in every branch. I can spearhead this in six months. We're going to be able to increase revenue really significantly at very low cost. And they would have none of it. And she said, listen, it cost me nothing but the gas to get out to the client to win these people back or win a significant number of them back. You're spending millions on your marketing and on your sales, getting the attention to bring in new customers. This is, this is nuts. And they wouldn't move. They wouldn't budge. Three weeks later, she quit. She said, I'm, I'm, I'm working at the wrong place. So there's a lot of reticence from revenue leaders, uh, this feet of clay. Right. OK, but what's the blind spot that finance has to this? Because if finance understood it, 
I would have thought that they'd be kicking up merry hell. I think you're right. I think that awareness is the other big reason why people don't do it. And this is one of the reasons why I did this Winback study, because I wanted to know, was, was my experience an outlier? And what my study found was that about one in four customers will come back if they're approached properly. Found that sales cycles are 70% shorter. Found that the average uh, SMB generates 485K with a, a Winback program, and it costs less than 5K to do the program. This is for SMBs. So I think if they knew all these numbers, I think that they would be much more open to saying, hey, listen, let's do a pilot. Let's see what the numbers are for our company. But they don't know the numbers. These numbers aren't, aren't really out there. Like, I mean, customer win back, when you win back a customer, their lifetime value more than doubles. There's a study out of Harvard. In the Harvard <laughs> Business Review, they showed this. Like 13, 12 or 13,000 customers came back Right, so they had 40,000 lost customers, 31% came back, whatever does that translate out to a little over 13,000, and their lifetime value more than doubled the second time around, right? I've won back thousands of, of lost customers myself. Second time around, they're worth at least 110% of what they were the first time. The reason I'm mentioning the Harvard study, the study that was uh, featured in Harvard Business Review, is just that it corroborates what my study found as far as the value of a customer that when it comes back. My study showed that 26% of customers return. In the Harvard study, it was 31%. So we're, we're in the ballpark, right? About one in four, one in three people come back. So the, the numbers are out there, but the problem is, is that there's no focus on the numbers. You know, I remember hearing a story about Mark Cuban when he took over the Mavericks. I guess it was a uh, opening day and he went to a Mavs game and it wasn't even sold out. This is opening day. I mean, this is crazy. So he said in this interview, I saw him say, I can do better. And I guess it was the following year he, he picked up the team. And one of the first things he, he did was he got all of his salespeople into a little bullpen, got a list of his old people, old customers, uh, old mm -hmm. subscribers, and a phone book and started phoning them. And the point of the story wasn't what he did about winning back. The point of the story was he wouldn't do anything he wouldn't ask his team to do. So win back foot fingerprints are all over the place, you know, yeah. but, but that's never the focus. And that's what it, I'm trying the, to do. That's why I'm evangelizing this. Well, uh, again, in the last recession, there was a marketing manager at HP's education division, and her budget was slashed from three million to ten thousand. Whoa! Yeah, and she had a thirty percent increase in her target. So she wrote to people who had bought courses in the previous eight years and offered them them something similar but different. She smashed her quota just by going back to previous customers and offering them something similar but different. This is where marketing can play their part in facilitating this because if they were good customers before, you know they're in your ICP, your ideal customer profile. Now, one of my biggest irritations is where I see marketing generating the wrong kind of lead because selling and marketing as a numbers game at a time when you have to be effective is not efficient because what it does is it creates a downstream cost. So 3% click through and 15% conversion means that the job to be done was failed 99.9955% of the time because no one runs adverts because they want click throughs. They run adverts because they want revenue then those leads get chucked over the fence to sales. On average, they have to follow up six to 11 times. If you've got 1,000 follow-ups, that's 6,000 to 11,000 calls. That 15 manual dials an hour, which is what most people are doing, that's an incredibly a huge amount of the team's time taken up. They then don't have the time for covering their existing accounts, their territory. And so at the end of the month or quarter, they have to make the sales. So they discount which then means that renewal and throughout the lifetime of that customer, you are paying a heavy price in terms of lost profit. And at renewal, you're already on your back foot. 
they sell to anybody, so often they'll sell to the wrong people, and they will rip out opportunities from next quarter's pipeline to feed this quarter's target which means that they then create a downstream problem. And then they chuck those wrong customers over the fence to CS, who now have a bunch of tickets open that they should never have had. All of those problems could have been prevented by not running the crappy adverts and attracting the wrong people. Winback allows you as marketing to deliver marketing qualified leads instead of marketing unqualified leads. Thoughts? Yes. So <laughs> you start right at the top. <laughs> yes. An emphatic, an emphatic yes. So, you know, right at the top of, right at the top, you talked about, you get this, this lead, a cold lead, and it's going to take how many, how many touches to engage them? On average, if you get a, a warm lead and you have to follow up with a phone call or emails, it's six to 11 touches at the moment. Okay. So there's six to 11. The average number of touches it takes to re-engage a past customer is one to three. That, that stat comes from uh, Jeb Blunt and some other research. And it's because they're familiar with you. They'll, you're not an unknown. You know who they are, and there's a very high probability that they'll answer your email or take your call. So You represent lower risk, less uncertainty. Exactly. And, and you know, even if you, you messed up in some area, you can come back and you can just say, listen, I'm here to learn, you know, where do things go sideways? And you're going to find holes in that leaky sales bucket that you never knew existed. So you're going to learn stuff by reaching out and talking to them. We're just talking about length of about resources, right? And and qualification. Yes, but not not only that, it's just the cost, the opportunity cost. If my reps are tied up following up dead leads, non-buyers who will never sorry, non-customers who will never become customers. They could but won't then what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to find a way of um, replacing the time and effort that they have put in in order to hit the number. Well, the way that we've done that traditionally is by hiring more people. Okay. Well, in this market, how many people are struggling to hire talented sellers? <laughs> yeah, and the thing about Winback is these sales are so much easier, right? They know <laughs> your brand. They know your product. It's not like you're coming in um uh, cold or semi-warm so you're you probably this, already on their payment system yeah you're you're probably an approved vendor you, you you know you've probably you've got a contract that might still be might still be valid but the thing is if you reach out think about everything you know like say you say you've got a this this group of leads so you've got 100 leads now you've got to research them you got to find out you know what does their company do who are the decision makers you know find out everything you can right well with your past customers you already know so much about them. You've seen inside their company. You know who, you know, you know who's who decision makers are. You know when the buying window opens. There's so many things you know. And when you know so much about them, you can create intelligent messaging to reach out, which makes it even easier to engage them or to re-engage them. So the amount of time it takes, just look in your CRM for these things. And, and, you know, so many customers, they'll tell you exactly what it takes to win them back. No customer, you call a customer, cold customer, you say, what will it take to win your business? You know, they're going to think you're some kind of an idiot. But you can go out to your past customers and literally ask them where things went sideways and what it will take to win them back. Jill Griffin actually uh, commissioned research on this. And she found that one out of three past customers will literally tell you what it'll take to win their business back. And she's got this great story about winning back the Honda account just by doing that. I am an idiot, obviously, because I always ask people what it will take to win their business. Oh, no, no, no. Quite no direct. That, that's not but, the that's not the idiot part. No, 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 no. no. But uh, literally, I'll I'll say to them, look, you probably never, you know, you've got no idea who I am. But look, at the end of this uh, conversation, what needs to happen for us to end up doing business? And often they'll tell me it's so much easier than guessing. Listen. If you can do that and make it work, that's fantastic. I was thinking about, you know, you're talking about it's hard to find good people. So so you've got these salespeople who aren't the cream of the crop, and you're trying to make it easy for them to make a sale. I think it's very good. For what you just did, I think that's that takes skill to make that come off as intelligent and inquisitive and, and you know, so if you can do that, that's fantastic. My my belief is that a lot of junior salespeople just can't do can't pull that off. Again, I get that they won't, and more often than not, that's self concept thing. 
but no one pops out their mother's womb able to sell. It's a learned skill. And mm -hmm. that just takes a bit of practice. 20 or 30 attempts to repeat that exercise um, is probably enough to develop the, uh, the chutzpah to be able to pull that off. You touch on some really interesting points here. You know, you, you've got this familiarity. Human beings, the number one driver of human beings is to look for what feels familiar. So make it easy for them by being that familiar thing. Go looking for bad news. Go run to the sound of gunfire. Because the worst thing that's going to come out of this, if they engage with you, is you're going to get some really good lessons and an opportunity for some humility. Because when our buyers are wrong, more often than not, it's our fault. I mean, name me a, a time in your entire career where the customer has made a terrible mistake and it wasn't down to some omission on our part. Um, a failure for us to raise a point that they needed to understand. And nine times out of 10, it's me. I love that idea or the way you, uh, you, you, you articulated as, you know, running towards the gunfire. Bill Gates said, we, our, our greatest learnings come from our most unhappy customers. And I, mm. I totally agree with that. I mean, you want to find out where things are heading south and, 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 and people will tell you. And, and when you learn these things, you can dramatically increase retention. You know, you've, you've got all these, you got all these customers that, that came in for X and you're giving them X, but you're also throwing Y in there. And that's just getting a lot of them angry and upset. Well, if you don't, if you're not aware of that, you're, you're in trouble. This is the, this is the, the beautiful thing about, about Winback. We've got, we've got feedback, feedback loops with acquisition. We got feedback loops with expansion. We got feedback loops with retention, you know, so that we can optimize all of those things, but we don't have a feedback loop for, for past customers. We're not going to, because we're afraid of, of like, why would we want to go talk to unhappy customers? That's emotionally, uh, uh that will answer that question. There's a really bloody good reason for it. Your good customers, your best customers are probably not going to tell you the full unvarnished truth because they like you. They don't want to upset you. Your average customer doesn't really know why they like you. You're just part of the furniture. The unhappy ones are the ones who are going to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And you need to go and find the truth. As a seller, we need to go and find the truth. As a marketer, as a manager, as a leader, we need to go and find the truth from our customers, especially the unhappy ones, because they will tell us what's wrong with our product, why it's impossible to use, why 24% of our sales agent's time is taken up dealing with people who couldn't navigate our website. Yeah, simple stuff like that. The benefits are tremendous. When we learn these things, we can increase our win rates. We'll get a better idea of our ICP. There's so many, so many benefits to this. It's, it's, it's okay. nuts. So let's deal with some unasked questions because I think it's instructive to help people to recognize what they're not seeing. Okay, so what are the most common unasked questions with regard to win back? I think... Will people come back is unasked because they think they already know the answer. People aren't going to come back. <laughs> so right off the bat, they don't even ask a question because it's it's a non-issue. So they're all mind readers. Oh, you know, that's that's a really, really important point. We think we know what other people are thinking. We think we know why our customers left. You know, we think we know why customers buy. This is this is delusional. There was a study out of the university in Chicago, and his professor found that you only, I might get the numbers wrong, but they're very close, you know. He yeah. said that you only know what your friends are thinking, like about 20% of the time, and even for your spouse or, or your children, somebody you really, really know well, you're only right 30% of the time. It's not just even. Don't know what, I'm sorry? Not even. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so... So, so, you know, when you, when you, you know, you read about statistics from um, uh, win-loss analyses and you find that the reason why people left is only right in the CRM, like 15% of the time, you know, guessing is not a strategy. You know, that's why, that's why we've got retention can go up so much if you just 
talk to your lost customers. You know, Tom Williamson, him and his EVP of sales, this was happened years ago, they took retention from 83 to 97%. And, you know, how did they do that? How were they able to find things that customer success didn't find? Customer service, the head of sales. How did all these people miss what Tom found? Well, he went out and he talked to them. You mean he actually spoke to customers? Well done, Tom. Good luck. <laughs> Who knew? And I'm minded of my one of my favorite Mark Twain quotes, which many of you will have heard before, which is, it ain't what you don't know that hurts you, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. He said you had a lot of good ones. That's a great one. Oh, he was so on the money. I mean, if you want to understand the human condition, him, Oscar Wilde, and Philip Larkin. Basically, you've got human psychology bottled up in uh, a few quotes from them. Talk to me about other unasked questions when it comes to the um, uh, win back. So the first one is, will they come back? What's the next one that's a natural follow-on from there that they're obviously not asking because they're not asking the first one? What's it going to cost me? Like, I mean, the cost of acquiring customers is just going up and up and up. I saw five year in the last five years, sixty uh, percent from uh, from profit. Well, I guess they're paddle now. I saw some an, another number from Bain. I haven't sourced it yet. It said it was some something very significant. Anyway, we all know that the cost of acquiring a customer is going up and up and up, and they don't even ask. Is and there it's another also a metric for- that senior leadership are measured on, isn't it? Say that again. I didn't catch that. It, sorry to interrupt, but isn't it a key metric that senior leadership are being measured on? I would think so. They should be if they aren't. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, I mean, you it's know, personal. We see that we've always done things this way. This is how we've generated revenue. We've got the, we've got this partnership ecosystem. We've got this. Uh, we 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 buy these type of ads. And they and you know we have Facebook just raised the cost of ads, or our conversion rate has, has gone down half a percent. So now it's going to cost that much more to get a new customer. We never look at all these relationships we've already got, and what if we just went back to them? Like like as as you mentioned earlier, just go back to these people, find out what they're looking for now. I guess the the basic idea is the question is we don't ask what could it cost. What are other ways? where we could acquire customers at a much lower cost. Another unasked question is, what would happen downstream? Like if we won back this customer, so when you get a customer, like just for argument's sake, you get a customer who's a little outside your ICP and you just made the argument that now customer service is gonna have to have have all kinds of problems because you're not delivering what you promised or exactly what they need. You know, all of these things. If you take on the wrong customer, you go back to speak to them, does it teach you that you should not take on that type of customer or does it inform you where you can develop your product and uh, move in and start uh, winning non-buyers who could be buyers, but they're not, they're adjacent, but with a little bit of a tweak, you could make it relevant to them. A hundred percent. So it's a double win. It's a win either side. And then if you find, this is, this is the, like another, another beauty of just going back to your past customers is that if you find something strong enough, like that in, that improvement in the product or whatever, and if you find a significant number of people you're able to win back by doing that, you just offer that to your current customers and retention's automatically going to go up. And then you take that same thing, you offer it into the general marketplace, and you're going to win more business. Now you've, so yeah, there's emphatically yes. So again, I think, the most obvious question is, what am I missing? Time and again, people need to look and spend time in deep reflection. Where is the money? Where are my potential customers? What is it that we do that they need at this time? Who could we possibly go and speak to? Have we already got relationships with those people? And I'm thinking here, a win back campaign in the channel in order to help your channel partners grow. Wow, what potential. Again, Kieran Cron, who Silke Ahrens, listen in, this is your stuff. Owen McGinty, uh, pay attention, okay? Think about the potential of running a structured win-back campaign, partner by partner, 
in order, to, especially pre-launch. Adam, have a listen. Yeah, this is really interesting. So if we were to do this, let's start thinking about creating a structured win back campaign then. So we've got about another half hour to play with. Talk to me about the structure of a win back campaign working backwards from the outcome being realized. Okay, so let's say six months down the road, you've done your win back and you've got all the, the, the downstream benefits, okay? So it's six months down the road, you now know what it takes, you, you now know why people left and you know what it takes to win them back, whatever value you need. So, so you've got that revenue. So like I said, if you're an SMB, chances are you've made in the neighborhood of four, four or 500 uh, grand. If you're uh, a large organization, I've seen it go up to like 68 million, like nationwide did a $68 million win back. So there's the, uh, the revenue, six months down the road, you've got that revenue. You've also got your retention rate has also gone up because when you did that win back, you found out why people were leaving, why they're still leaving, right? So you found that, you plugged that hole or you plugged it or you mitigated that hole. You fixed everything that was fixable. So you plugged a bunch of holes in your leaky sales bucket. So retention went up for that reason. You also maybe added new value to win people back. As I said before, stop what you're doing wrong and do something extra big enough to win them back. And when you found that something extra, that other value that's big enough to draw them back in, you give that to your current customers also. Okay. And so now that increases retention more. So all these people who would have churned because of whatever poor customer service, a product, piece of your product was missing, that's fixed. So retention goes up because of that. And then retention goes, so people who would have churned for that reason won't churn anymore. And now there's another reason for them to stay this other value that you created. I'm just giving you a like. A okay, period. so six months before that, what are the conditions that need to be in place to make that possible? What are the so, functions you have to have in place? What are the activities you have to have in place on a regular basis, the cadence? Sure. So the first thing you do, let's just do a basic win back program first, and then you can tell me where you want to dig in. So the very first thing we do with win back is we figure out who we want to win back then we try to understand them, and then we create a win-back campaign for them. So, so that's step, like an ABM campaign. It's an, a single account that you're nope. targeting. Well, it depends. If you've got very big customers, you can do it that way. But there's two types of customers, right? You've got really special, super high margin, super high value customers. You want to deal with them on a one-to-one -a, a -one basis. Most of your customers you're going to try to win back the maximum number in the minimum amount of time while mm -hmm. building the relationship for the next campaign. Okay. So let's just talk higher level first of all, okay? So let's just say that you're a SaaS company and you've got all these people that are you're on for like 300 bucks a month or something, okay? Let's just talk about that type of person first. So you identify the ones that are most likely to come back and it have got the highest value. So we already know that uh, customer lifetime value doubles, right? So we take a look at the previous lifetime, their previous lifetime value, and we pick out the ones with the higher lifetime value. And we also take a look at things like recency and frequency, and we just throw that all into uh, a formula. We plug everybody into the formula, and we and there's going to be really high probability wins, medium and low especially if you've got other data, like you know why people left. Anyway, the bottom line is you you find out, you you create a list of, of past customers that you want to go after. And then what you do is you find out, then you talk to them, right? You find out why did you leave, what it'll take to win you back, all that kind of stuff, right? And we can go into a lot more detail about how you do that if you wish. So then after we get that information, then we create a program. We find that most people, they left for these three reasons. This is the top reason why they left. And so what we do is we, we build a, a campaign around that biggest reason. Okay, so that's the messaging. We create an offer that takes care of that reason and adds something that they said they wanted, right? We found out why they left, so we fix that. We find out what it'll take to win them back. 
And then whatever we can do to create that thing to win them back, then we offer it to them. We put that into the offer and then we launch it. And then what happens is we see after we do the launch and after we, we do the campaign, again, this is a really high level generic. I'm just trying to give you a lay of the land. Yeah. After the campaign is over, we do a win-loss analysis. We find out why did people actually buy and why did people actually not buy, okay? And what we're going to find is that the people who bought tend, will tend to cluster for a specific reason or a group of reasons why they bought. And the people who didn't buy are going to have a cluster in a bunch of reasons why they didn't. And so what this does is this tells us who is willing to come back right now who's more in our ICP right now and who isn't. And then we can take the who isn't and we can see, do we want to actually keep those, or win those people back and then we can create that value. Let me just kind of bring it home with a, a, a quick story just because it's kind Wait. of like airy and nebulous. So um, as far as the, the win-loss analysis goes, Inc. Magazine did a, uh, a win-back program for their magazine subscribers. And at the end of the campaign, they did a win-loss analysis. So they, they reached out to the people who bought. They reached out to the people who didn't buy. And the people who bought, they wanted longer articles with five or six takeaways that they figured out for themselves. The people who didn't come back, they wanted shorter articles. They wanted one takeaway. They wanted to be told what that takeaway was. Okay. So here... This, this this information is, is pure gold, right? Absolutely. So now what they did is they, they I'm sorry? Uh, absolutely. So so they adjusted their sales, they adjusted their marketing, so they really targeted, you're going to get, you know, these these nice deep articles and you're going to get a lot of takeaways from them and stuff. So they're, they could be more specific, hit their ICP harder. And that's what they did. And their win rates went up. Uh, retention went up because they were they were doing they were focusing more on exactly what their ICP wanted. Now, they could have also had or created a sister publication or something else with all these people who didn't come back. Because how how hard is it to take these deep articles, condense them down, and 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 um and give you Thumb the takeaway? Down a bit, yeah. So anyway, the point is they got to know their people so much better after the fact, right? So they already Absolutely. did pre work. So the learning continues. The learning continues. Exactly. So again, it feels very iterative and it feels like this is continuous process that you are wise to uh, keep reviewing because it drives up your profits. You know, your cost of sale goes down, the speed of customer acquisition speeds up, the lifetime value increases. I can't see the downsides. What are the downsides? Let's look at that. You know... I was actually thinking about the downsides and all I could think is more of the upsides we haven't talked about, like improving brand reputation and all these other things. You know, there's, there's, I, I can't think of any, because think of human psychology. When you reach out to people again, even if they don't come back, okay, you're my customer, you left, I reach out, I say, you know, Marcus, where did things go sideways? And you tell me, and let's just say you had a bad experience with me. Okay. You've just told me this story. I've empathized with you and I've said, you know, either we can fix it or we can't fix it, but thanks for sharing. Daniel Kahneman's peak end rule kicks in right now. So the last thing that they think about, you think about my company now is, oh, they're nice people, they care, as opposed to the last time, the last touch was previously these a-holes, they yeah. screwed me over. So so that's one thing. Then what happens is since you tried to, to fix it, there's another piece of human psychology that kicks in called the pratfall effect. And what that says is that if you make a mistake and you try to recover from it, it shows you care and you become more likable. So this is just human psychology, right? So it's just reaching out just, and so what happens is all that negative word of mouth from these unhappy customers, that starts to really go down. So that increases your brand reputation, which makes it easier to sell. And it's just, I can't think of anything, any downside to this. All I think is more and more upsides. Well, I, I, I'll tell you where I see the pushback. It's with people who look at the work that's involved and consider the change to be too uncertain and people whose egos are too brittle to go and find, to have the conversation with an unhappy customer and risk hearing where they were in the wrong 
and to have to apologize. I, I think it comes down to those factors more often than not, doesn't it? And you can get a third party to go out and do this outreach. And so it might even be beneficial to get a third party because they might get more honest answers. So, so yes, there's fragile egos. And you know, there's, there's another thing, and that's that if the head of sales or head of marketing says, you know, I want to go do a win back, they might be afraid that, well, the CEO might be saying, well, if it's so great, why, do, why, why didn't we do this five years ago? You know, I mean, that's, that's also a problem. This is where, again, I think for those people who are probably a little bit reticent about putting all the effort into a win back campaign, uh, one of my clients, Nikki Parker, her primary offer is doing customer interviews. She'll go and interview the customers, whether they are happy, unhappy or otherwise, and get that information for you. Your marketing team needs to be doing customer interviews. Your salespeople need to be doing customer interviews. There's a fabulous book called The Mon Test, if you haven't read it. And it's really about trying to get unbiased responses from people when you ask about your product and your service and their experience. If you ask your mother, she's going to tell you nice things. Okay, so the structure of the questions is really important. They cannot be leading. They need to create the conditions of safety where the person that you're talking to feels that they can open up and tell you the full truth without feeling like you're going to judge them or otherwise that they're not going to be disliked for it. Because you really need this information. I cannot stress enough how crucially important it is that we gather information from our customers on a regular basis. And leaders need to be talking to their peers as well. So executive involvement can be very powerful in wearing back. Let's take a few minutes talking about that. How does that bring in your senior executive team to go and eat a little bit of humble pie play out? Sometimes it sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, the thing I like to talk to CEOs because their primary driver is always how can we do better? If it's a CRO, it's somebody who who wants to make a real difference. You know, it's like my ego, you know, I've only been here for, for, for 12 months. And I guess what I'm saying is that there, there are people who are more concerned with how they, they appear. And there's people who are more concerned with doing better. And if you're more concerned with, if you're the type of person who's more concerned with doing better, it's like, that's the kind of person who's going to have a much better chance of doing win back. I think it was an HBR article, but it was talking about an experiment where you're given sticks of spaghetti, paper clips, and uh, sellotape. And the job is to build the highest tower. The highest tower was built by the kindergarten kids. The lowest tower was built by the MBAs. And the <laughs> conclusion of the study was that the MBAs spent most of their time status managing, whereas the kindergartners just got on with it and experimented, and they just played with it. And I think there is an element of this, which is that you've got some of that not invented here. This is the way we do things around here. Because I don't think people fear change. People fear the uncertainty that accompanies it. So how can we create the conditions where they feel like the win back is a certain win and they're not going to end up with egg on their face? I think that if they manage it as a test, like we don't know if this is going to work. This is an interesting idea. Why don't we do a pilot test? Let's just take Two people go through this process, identify 50 customers, just like just like Carl did, right? Like he was given this, this small group of people and he went out and figured out what ideas on how to win them back. It was like, the, here's the thing. If you do just a win back test, you devote a small amount of resources to it and you see that these numbers actually pan out for your business. Now you're working, you're not working from fear or or anything like that, you're working from data. Let's work from data. Does Winback work for my company? And how much risk is involved if you take two people off for four weeks, two days a week, you know, to do this? You know, they're still doing their regular jobs. Yes. Okay. Very interesting. So let's get back to the process. So we've done our planning. We've uh, worked out why they left, what it'll take to win them back. And we've put together an offer that fixes the problem and adds some extra value to give them the impetus to the win back. What happens next? Well, okay, so we we run the campaign once and we've done the 
win-loss analysis, right? So the campaign is done. So then what we do is we maintain and try to build a relationship with those past customers who didn't come back, okay? Because what we want to do is we want to come back to them in maybe four months, six months time and try to win them back again. And what we're going to do is we're going to take everything we learned from that win-loss analysis to try to get them back, right? So that we found out why people didn't come back. And so they might be telling us other things like, sure, you fixed problem A, but problem B was really my big problem. So now you got all the people who had the problem B. Remember I told you at the top where we probably find three reasons why people left and we're going to focus on the top reason first Mm -hmm. and we're going to mitigate that and create something around that. That's what we do. We've done the first. On the second campaign, we'll hit the second thing. On the third campaign, we'll hit the third thing. Okay. It's interesting. Alex Hormozzi's model for making compelling one-time offer effectively is that you look for the top few pain indicators, and then you give them an offer to solve the second most important one. Oh, Um, really? Yeah, that's interesting. 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 And the offer solves the problem, but then it creates another problem in its stead. It can be three, four, five layers deep, the offer. And each time, each layer of the offer is worth the price that they pay or higher. The other thing about winning back people is that you might have one set of approaches for, like we talked about, low value people, medium value, and high value. So, you know, let's go back to Mark Cuban. He wants to uh, win back people. So there might be people who only bought one or two tickets one year. So he might just do an email campaign with them, right? Something very low cost to win them back. For the people who might have bought a single season of cheap seats, maybe in a thousand dollar purchase, that might be worth two phone calls, maybe. People who bought seasons tickets for like five years for like high end seats, that might be worth inviting them out for a, a batting practice day or a visit to the VIP lounge um, for a preseason game. So, I, so you know admit, I, mean? I thought they were American football. Uh, okay. <laughs> so now you're mentioning batting, it's changed my perspective fractionally. <laughs> <laughs> so Mavericks uh, are a baseball team. Okay, got it. Mavericks are a basketball team. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> but the thing is, is that you can try different approaches. Like we just said, you can stack approaches. And I mean, this is like one of those secret sauces of win back is that when you do your first campaign, that's where you really learn. You get a really good solid idea of how your customer base acts and reacts to things. And then the second campaign, you know, so much more so that that's much more nuanced. And then you can start trying different approaches. Like I said, direct mail, personal notes. By the time you've done your third campaign, you've really zeroed in on how to keep people, how to increase win rates. And um, that's really a 12 month, 12 month exercise to do three iterations. Oh, yeah. Easy. As you go, what you're doing is you're then presumably better informing your ICP and your direct marketing for new cold new uh, customers. What impact has that information had on company's performance in the cold market because of the information that they've gathered within the Wimback campaigns? I think with with the cold outreach, now they know who to target better, right? Like, let's just go back to the um, example from Inc. Now they know that they can say, you know, these are longer stories. You're going to get all these takeaways. Every month, we've got five articles. You're going to, this is a, a read really worth reading, as opposed to you're going to learn a bunch of more generic stuff. You're targeting people more, your win rates are going to be higher, you're going to be much, it's going to be much more efficient ad spend, for example, or the partners you find, right? So by and large, our research from my other business, what we found was that people in the C-suite are people who tend to want more and more information. Entrepreneurs, not entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, people who um, are on their own, They don't have time for the longer articles. They don't have time to do the consideration. They're more like, give this to me, give this to me, give this to me. I got 18 other things to do today. So it'll inform your target market. It'll inform what to say to your target market. It'll tell you so many things. And you know, one of the 
one thing I, I wanted to get squeeze in here, just like shoehorn this one idea, yeah. is that when you do these win back campaigns and you do this win loss, you're going to find that you're losing people maybe to a specific competitor. And then you ask them, well, what's about that competitor is special? Like, what are they doing? And what you find is that in your customer ecosystem, things are changing in that in their customer ecosystem. And when things change with one customer, they might be changing for the whole market. And so like when one changes, they're, they're like a, 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 a school of fish changing. And it's just like, you know, think about, this is a really basic over the top example, but think of if Blockbuster talk to all their lost customers, you know, when Netflix was coming in. What if they said, where are you going? Why are you going there? And like 60% of them were going to Netflix. And you find, and you ask them, why are they doing that? You know, and I said, well, because they're doing X, Y, and Z that you're not doing. And they could have seen that coming much more clearly. Because if you're actually talking to customers and you're seeing that they're they're abandoning you for a specific thing, that shows market changes. And it doesn't so, have to be something, go ahead. Does, um, what, sorry. And it doesn't have to be something major. There's all these minor things that are happening constantly as markets are evolving. And you're going to get this information, a lot of it ahead of time. You're going to know what matters to them and what doesn't. We've got to remember the basics. Buyers buy for their reasons and their reasons only. They don't give a damn about your quota. They don't care one way or the other if you've managed to generate uh, you know, enough revenue to make President's Club. What they want to know for sure is that they're going to get the outcome that they paid you for. They, they really don't expect that you're going to sell them something that is substandard, but more often than not, they're disappointed. So we, we mismatch expectations because we don't spend enough time defining exactly what the customer wants. We spend too much time trying to sell them stuff. And I think one of the most instructive parts of this process will be to discover just how terrible your sales process and the experience <laughs> is and how mismatched it is to their buying journey. Because the buyer's journey doesn't end when the transaction is over. There's deciding, then there's first use, then there's ongoing use. And as their context changes, we have to adapt. How often are we missing the opportunity to pick up a customer who could be a churn risk simply because we're not asking these questions and we're not educating ourselves to find the bad news. So many companies, they try to find the bad news by talking to current customers. That'll tell you some of the bad news. But if you want to know why a customer left, you got to talk to a customer who left. And if you want to find out why a customer left, you have to talk to them. If you talk to a current customer, like why would you leave? That's guesswork. You've got to talk to somebody who's actually left, find their reasons, and then find what's at the core of those reasons. This has been incredibly instructive. I'd like to talk further. So if you'd be willing to come back, we can have uh, another crack at this because there's so much more to unpack. I'd love to. Before we hang up, how can people get hold of you? I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, Dan Fister, Dan M. Fister on LinkedIn. That's the best place to find me. There's a, I've got a lot of articles, a ton of posts, a lot of information there. Or go to winbacklabs.com and uh, there's a lot more there. Or dan at winbacklabs.com to email me directly. Excellent. One bit of advice that if you had a golden ticket and you could whisper in the ear of the idiot Dan age 23, what would you have said to him that he'd have ignored? Everything is going to work out fine. Just do your best. Don't worry. You know, that's the, the single most common bit of golden ticket advice I've got. And really? I do hope people listen because just stop taking yourself so damn seriously. If you make a bad cold call, no one dies. The reality is it's just poor role performance. It doesn't make the end of the day, you know, bring the end of the world. You can learn, you can improve. Dan, thank you very much for this. So if you've enjoyed this conversation, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And please do share it with your sales leaders, with your CFO, with your CRO, with your chief commercial officer, with the rest of your sales team, because there's money in them, their hills. And there's a lot of it, and it's a lot easier than going cold. It'll cost you a fraction, if anything, 
to win those customers back. And more importantly, it's going to make your life a hell of a lot easier and bring some certainty into your pipeline. Now, if you're looking for a way to make what used to work in terms of your training work again, because the context has changed and you're finding that they're just not responding, you've got deals that are ghosted, you've got fat middle of the pipeline that's stuck, give me a call. I'll send you my selling aptitude test. We'll spend 15 minutes analyzing what the results mean for you. If you want to talk to me about coaching after that, that's fine. But I'm giving 15 minutes of my time analyzing your results based on your responses. So if anyone wants to get in touch with me, Marcus at laughsiphonlast.com and via LinkedIn. And there will be a link to the selling aptitude test on the blurb. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.